Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Mike Thompson, and you just tuned in to The Father's Show with Mike Thompson. So I want to thank you for joining us today. We have a great show for you today. Today on The Father's Show, we have attorney Lana Sharir, and she has been practicing law for over 20 years with the last 10 years focused exclusively in family law. And she has even used mediation and family law uh, in her own divorce. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Lena Sharir. Hey, Lena, how are you? Hello, Mike. Uh, fabulous. And I'll pronounce it for you because it's uh, commonly mispronounced. It's Lana Shearer. Lana Shearer. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Oh, no, it's okay. So it's commonly mispronounced, huh? Yes. Um, my former name, my maiden name was Lana Brown. And so when I changed it to Shearer, um, many of the judges just continued calling me by my maiden name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... You have been practicing law for over 20 years and exclusively in family law. And I was reading your bio and you did mediation in your own divorce, uh, which myself, I'm a big advocate for. I really wish more people would understand how important it is to do mediation and keep the court system out of your divorce as much as you possibly can. So I applaud Absolutely. you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's, it's really a passion project for me. I love what I do. I'm really um, grateful that I get to practice mediation and work with families to try and keep them out of court. Mm -hmm. And I practice what I preach in my daily life, in my own relationship, in my own divorce. Um, we worked with a family law mediator and were able to stay out of court. And I think it's important um, for people to understand that the way you start your divorce is really important. It's probably one of the most important choices that you're going to make along that journey is how you're going to proceed. Really? Are you going to drag someone into court right away? Or is there an opportunity that you can mediate and try and work out agreements on your own without having to have you know, court orders. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important decision to make at the very outset is how you want to handle your divorce. Well, I agree. I actually did my, excuse me, my second divorce that way. And it really was beneficiary uh, so much easier. Uh, we didn't really have all the argument, all the fussing and fighting and, you know, people fighting over, as I always say, a lamp. You know, a ten dollar lamp, right. and they, you know, spending uh, five hundred dollars an hour to fight over a ten dollar lamp. So yeah, because it's really not about the lamp. No, it's just feelings, and it's a difficult process. Um, but if you, yeah, if you try and work out your agreements on your own, what I like to tell people is, um, I also volunteer as a temporary judge. Uh, once every quarter. And so I see cases one week before they're set for trial. Mm -hmm. And during that process, we're going to sit down and try and work out agreements. And by now, they've been involved in litigation for anywhere from six, nine, you know, 18 months, a few years, and spent many thousands of dollars, yeah. 20, 30, 40 thousands of dollars on their attorneys to basically sit down and do the same process that I like to help people do in the beginning, which is let's talk about what there is to divide. Let's talk about what the issues are in your divorce. Mm -hmm. And then let's see if there's ways we can reach compromises um, and save that twenty, thirty thousand dollars that you will spend going to trial where you still have to try and reach agreements before they'll allow you to go to trial. Yeah. So these are, you litigate over uh, divorces, I take it. Um, yes, anything family court related. So okay. divorce, um, child custody, parenting plans, support issues, or for unmarried couples who share a child. You know, there's still that process to have someone established as a legal father, get some custody and support orders in place. So anything dealing with family law. Yeah, okay. 
And today we're going to be talking about child support and child custody and the common misconception about both. Uh, can you explain that a little bit? Uh, what is the misconception between child support and child custody? I'll say the number one misconception is that people believe if you share 50-50 custody with the other parent, that you will not pay child support. Mm -hmm. And that's not at all what that means. A 50-50 parenting time um, is, you know, hopefully what's best for your child. But child support is based on the relative incomes of the two parents. And so in California, we use a child support calculator that will give us what we call guideline support. Um, and in that calculator, it takes into account your, the gross incomes of the parties, their deductions like um, health insurance or mandatory retirement. There's different things that go into this calculator and it includes the tax basis for each parent. Um, and then of course, one of those factors that you input in there is the custodial timeshare. But that's just one of the factors the, the greater indicator for whether or not child support will be payable is the disparity or the difference in incomes of the parties. Mm -hmm. um, because in California, the goal of child support is to distribute income between the parents of this child to make sure that that child can live in a relatively similar standard of living in both households. Mm -hmm. So just yeah. because you share 50 50 custody does not mean that child support will be zero. Now you mentioned just something just now, and you said in both households, you know, the child can, can live. So a lot of times, you know, us men, we hear, or we feel that the woman is getting the house and he has to go find a place to, to live. He's paying child support and with the child support he's paying, he really can't afford to live in the same lifestyle that he had when he was married. But the wife the, or the former wife gets to. So is that something that's different in California or, you know, they try to take that in consideration what he needs to live on? Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, the purpose is to distribute the income between the two households for the benefit of the child. Now, okay. obviously it's always more expensive, twice as expensive to have two separate households as one. Right. You know, when we're married or just or cohabitating, we're able to pool all our money together and we're paying for one house payment or one rent, one set of utilities. Yeah. It is necessarily going to be more expensive to have two households now. Yeah. Um, so that's why I didn't say the same standard of living because I don't, <laughs> it, often it's not possible to maintain the exact same standard of living. Okay. But we want the standards of living to be relatively similar between the two households for the child. So the child can enjoy the same type of lifestyle in both households. Mm -hmm. you know, there are cases where you have an extraordinary high earner you know, an NFL football player or a NBA basketball player and mm -hmm. where their income is, you know, far exceeds what perhaps a child's needs might be. And there's special rules in those cases where, um, you know, we're not just going to apply the guideline calculator there because that would, that would result in, in it would result in, um, you know, funds being paid to the other party that would be far exceeding the expenses of the child. But in regular normal household incomes where we have two wage earners or perhaps you know only one wage earner child support is there to distribute the income between the households and i don't look at it as you know where if a man or the father had to move out many of my cases um, the mother will be the one to move out it just really depends on their unique circumstances as mm -hmm. to which one of them is the higher wage earner and which one is going to be able to stay in the house or if, they, if either one of them could even afford to stay in the house, right, that might right. not be an economic reality for them. Yeah. So in mediation, we look at the whole and we look at all of their needs together and we try and come up with support orders that meet all of their needs. Okay. So what is the difference between a common child's custody arrangement? What is the most common child custody arrangement? Let me ask you that. Um. 
I find that an equal shared parenting schedule is the most common. Um, and what that looks like can differ from family to family and depending on the age of your children. Uh, a very common one and one that I follow with my own children, it's a two, two, five. So, you know, every Monday and Tuesday, the child is with one parent, every Wednesday, Thursday, the child with, with the other parent, and then you alternate weekends. And the goal of that type of parenting arrangement is to ensure that your children have frequent and consistent contact with both parents. We know, you know, through studies that it's, it's really important for the children's development to have that consistent, frequent contact with both parents. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. in an ideal world, everyone will just live together and be happy. But divorce <laughs> happens. That's yeah. not reality. So we're trying to at least ensure that those bonds are maintained and having that frequent, consistent contact has been shown to you know, really uh, enforce those bonds. Yeah. Now, I've heard fathers, uh, you know, that I've talked with, they have an arrangement where they have the child for six months and the mother has a child for six months. And then they in between that, they alternate weekends uh, like every other weekend or something like that. Uh, do you find that something that's common or a good practice? Um, I, in my own opinion and observation and, you know, through my experience, that would tend to be long periods of time without the other parent. So obviously if you live in different states, you're going yeah. to have longer periods of time between, um, the child being able to have that contact. It, but if you live close, if you live in the same city, if you live, you know, within a reasonable driving distance, the more frequent time that you can have with the child to have with both parents is better for their development. Okay. Um, some for older children, maybe, you know, or even for younger children, a week on week off schedule mm -hmm. uh, had worked well for a lot of families or it depend has to be feasible for your work life, your schedule. You know, are you able to do a week on week off? Do you have, you know, or did your schedule just not allow for it? So we want to keep it realistic. I mean, it's, it's yeah. the pur purpose is to maintain that bond with the parent and the child, but also making sure that it's not creating additional stress for the parents. Yeah. We want it to be convenient and, and work out for the parents as well as the child. Now, how does a court determine what is the, in the best interest of the child, especially when I know when they're over 12 or 13, you know, the court can talk to the child, but when they're younger, you know, the child might not be able to articulate exactly how they feel or where they think is best or how they can handle a week on a week off or so forth. How does a court determine what's best? Um, so first off, I want to uh, correct or address one thing that you said was from 12 and on the court can speak with the child. Um, actually, it's after that age, a, a child may be presumed competent to be able to testify in court um, but really, we never want to have a child have to testify in court if mm -hmm. possible, because we know that's not in their best interest. Um, having a child voice their opinion on to which, uh, which parent they want to live with or who they want to see more often puts them in a predicament that we want to avoid if possible. Yeah. Um, so that would be very stressful on a child. Uh, so what we do is we in Sacramento County and in many counties in California, we use uh, family court services. We use an in-court mediator and that person will interview the family. It'll interview the parents and get the parents input into what they would like to see as a schedule and mm -hmm. what they think would be the best interest. And then also they interview the children five and up. So any any child over the age of five, um, they'll interview and get you know, an idea of how that child is doing, their well-being, their, you know, personality type. Um, it's an interview, but it's not a, you know, in, it's not an interrogation. It's an interview to find out how well adjusted the child is. And in some cases, likely when the children are a little older, um, they may be able to weigh in with their input on, you know, what they'd like to see as a custody schedule. Um, but what we try to avoid is putting that choice into the hands of a child if possible, because that's a lot like choosing one parent over another. Mm -hmm. So we, we take all the relevant information and then the family court mediator will make a recommendation to the court on what parenting schedule 
they believe is in the best interest of this child based on all the information that they gathered. Yeah, and, and I know in the, in the past, most cases, women were awarded custody of the child as the primary care giver. Have you seen that process changed a little bit more over the last few years? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I no longer find that it's a presumption. It's not presumed that a mother is going to be a superior caregiver. It is really based on how that family interacted, who was actually you know, involved with the children. Um, it's really about the bonds that the mm -hmm. child has with each parent, with a mother and a father, and that bond is equal um, you're both parents, you know, you both have an important role in shaping the development of that child. And each one is equally important. Yeah. I'm, I, you know, I've been practicing in family court for the last 10 years. And during my time and practice exclusively family law, I have not seen um, a presumption favoring a mother over a father. And I'm really happy to say that, that I have not witnessed it. And I'm very happy to hear that because I have seen that. And, and unfortunately, I went through it and I've had friends mm -hmm. that have gone through it. Uh, but I have heard and seen of late uh, that that is not a preconsumption that, you know, when the, mm -hmm. the parents come in, that the mother's going to get it. Because I personally was told that uh, when I was going for custody of my daughter, that they told me, the, you know, the short of me bringing the, her mother in with needle marks up her arm, the chance of me getting my daughter was slim and none. Uh, mm, wow, so, that's unfortunate. Yeah, uh, it didn't happen. I, it took me a while, but I did get custody of her. Uh, but I've also seen a good friend of mine who uh, went through similar things and the court was really, I mean, he was had told the mom, hey, I'm recording our conversations. And when he presented that to the court, the court said, if I ever even hear of you recording another conversation, I'm going to hold you in contempt and put you in jail, yeah. which I know is not against the law to record a conversation as long as you notify the person that you are doing it. But so I, I'm happy to see that a lot of this is changing. And that the when they say in the best interest of the child is really something that the judge means. Absolutely. Um, the judge is really a difficult role, you know, because you have 15 minutes as a judge in your courtroom to assess, you know, this family and. Uh, the child and the child's well-being and to make these court orders that will impact that child for a long time mm -hmm. and shape that child's development, health, yeah. mental health, physical health. You have 15 minutes maximum to really look at this and make a good choice. Um, so that's why we count on the family court mediators who will meet with everyone involved first and gather that necessary information and make that recommendation. So at least the judge is feeling that you know, someone has taken more time and in looking into this and then the judge, you know, can evaluate that recommendation, talk to the parties there during the 15 minutes, um, see if there's any questions or if there was any any inaccuracies. Um, but it's a really difficult position to be in to make yeah. you know, child custody orders are some of the most important orders in a family law matter. And they impact the children the most. Yeah. Now. You know, you mentioned mediation and, and like you said, I'm a big advocate for mediation and I think that's great. Now, when a, a divorced couple go into, you know, the mediation, can they decide for themselves that neither party uh, has to pay child support because they, you know, they're both income earners and, you know, maybe it's a difference of you know, a couple of hundred bucks or a thousand bucks, something like that. Uh, so they decide, no, we're going to split it 50 50 and nobody's going to pay child support. Is that something that, you know, the court would approve? Um, it is. Uh, before we make those decisions, you know, the process is to first figure out what child support would be. 
So I use the guideline calculator. We're going to talk about what child support would be if you, you know, we're going into court. I think that's an important thing to talk about because in California, the right to support doesn't belong to either parent. The right to child support belongs to the child. Mm -hmm. And so we have our own organization, you know, the Department of Child Support Services, that at any time, one of the parents can seek child support for the other um, because that right belongs to the child. So first we look at what child support would be, and then we can talk about different types of arrangements. If, if oftentimes I have couples that agree, you know, we don't need child support from the other, mm -hmm. that's fine. We can do a zero child support order. There's important legal language that needs to be in there that both of them are fully informed and this is not the result of any coercion. But they both also have to understand that at any time this could change. It's always modifiable. As long as you share minor children, child support is an issue, even if child support is set at zero. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can reach those agreements. It's really important that you have the proper legal language in your settlement agreement, um, that you understand you know, the, the, that it belongs to the child and that either one of you could change it at any time. Okay. Now, if a mother gets sole custody, uh, is that or does she have a right or able to deny the father any visitation whatsoever? Um, so there's legal custody and there's physical custody. Um, and at any time, if you share children, you have the right to seek visitation with your child. So if the other parent isn't willing to do it voluntarily, then you would have to seek orders from the court. And then that goes to family court services who assesses what type of visitation would be proper. Um, a parent should never deny the other child the right, or the other parent the right to see their child unless there's some really good reasons, which would be it's not safe for the child. It's a threat to their health, safety, and well-being. But even then there's ways to get around that, like you could do supervised visitation. So even if someone has a substance abuse issue or there is some question as to whether or not they would be able to you know, be safe with that child alone, then supervised visitation. There's agency supervised visitation or a trusted family member that could facilitate visitation. So, you know, it, it, hopefully, the parents will understand how important it is to the child's development to have contact with both parents. Yeah. But what that contact might look like is very individualized if there's some issues, substance abuse, violence in the yeah. home, those type of things. Now, is there a way, because, you know, we hear, and I know where it goes on both sides, you hear fathers accuse mothers of doing things and mothers accusing fathers of doing things. But... I'm going into a presumption of, you know, since mothers generally have custody of the, you know, primary custody of the cow. Is there a way for a father that is being scrutinized, um, even though he's not doing anything, he's been accused of doing things and that's keeping him away from the child. Is there a way for him to get around that? Uh, or to prove otherwise? So first and foremost is you want to follow the direction of the court. So oftentimes the court gives you an opportunity to prove yourself. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the main goal is to make sure a child is safe. So immediately, if those type of allegations are brought, the court must investigate because you need to make sure that the child is safe. Um, but, and then they'll usually give a set of instructions you know to someone who's been accused of, of any wrongdoing involving a child or violence or so forth um, of things that you could do to prove yourself off anger management or if it's substance abuse you know involve in a program um, if it's anything regarding abuse cps is usually involved so cps will also do an investigation but if you keep in mind that what the court is doing is to really try and figure out what is in the best interest of that child and whether or not there are any truth to the allegations that have been brought, um, keep that in mind and that your goal is to be able to be with your child um, and not necessarily fight against it. Mm -hmm. um, false allegations are 
really um, frowned upon by the court. So if a court eventually is going to get to the bottom of this and find out if someone is lying, and if a parent has lied or made false allegations, the court is going to give some consequences for that. The consequence could be an immediate shift in custody um, amongst man, many other you know, remedies, but false allegations are very serious and nobody should bring those unless they are sure that there is something yeah. happening that threatens the safety of that child. And I was gonna ask you about that because you hear a lot of that and like I said, that even happened to me, uh, but that's years ago. Uh, but it is something that you sometimes hear that these false allegations are launched against someone, against a parent, and but nothing, no recourse, no uh, penalty for the person that does it, you know, so that has changed as well. Oh, I've, I've seen it. Absolutely. Okay. So, you know, the, what it's, it's hard. It's really hard when you are under a microscope in family law, if you've been accused of something and now the light is shining on you, it, it's a difficult position to be in. And it takes some time because they really do have to investigate and figure it out. But you have to, you know, understand the end game, which is to, for the fact that this is false to come to life. You have to hang in there, don't give up. You can't just mm -hmm. give up and say, the court's never gonna believe me. It, it really, you're on the path to proving that this was false and that you are not, you have not done the things you're accused of and it requires perseverance. You have to hang in there because there will be an end to it. And many people just get frustrated and angry and don't believe in the system and walk away. Um, and that's really sad. I, yeah. you know, I don't like to see that. And, and that's very true because I know, how, you know, me and generally, we'll just say, you know, screw it and mm -hmm. go on. And the, the bad part about that is the child is the one that suffers, you know, and because if they, if I agree with you, both parents need to be in the child's life, if all possible. And when you alienate one, and, you know, the father says, you know what, screw it. I, I got better things to do. I'm not going to put myself through this, this aggravation. The court is not going to ever believe me. So they just walk away. And the child is the one that's growing up angry and mad because he thinks the father doesn't love him. So it's I'm very happy to hear that the court is now looking at those things differently. Yeah, it, I can give a personal uh, statement about that where I witnessed an adult child and I was helping, um, I was acting as a temporary judge and the mother and father were still in court battling over support many years later. And, you know, they have an adult child. He was in his 20s, mid 20s. And one of the parents brought the child to court with him. And that child had not seen his father in many years. And in fact, his father had turned away and had given up um, and the fight was just too much. And the son actually spoke with his father for the first time in a long time. And he looked at me and said, why didn't you fight for me? And for me, that was really powerful. Um, you know, he, because by his father walking away, that son likely felt he doesn't care. He doesn't care enough to continue to fight for me. Yeah. And so it was yeah. a really emotional reunion and I was grateful to be able to witness it, but sometimes you do, you have to stay in there and fight for your children and it will yeah. matter in the long run. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I, you know, I've seen like the, the guy that I was talking about earlier, we ended up becoming best friends because we were both fighting for our daughters. And so we had this common ground that we were standing on. He was fighting for his, I was fighting for mine. And ironically enough, he had been fighting longer than I had. And it took me five years, but I ended up getting my daughter before he got his. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it finally took the court uh, to see that the we weren't the problem. 
it was the mothers that were the problem. And uh, it's, I know it, it played a serious part on me, because like for me, I almost left the country. I, you know, the mother was bothering me to the point that I said, you know what, I'm leaving the country. And the only reason I end up staying was for my daughter. Uh, I just couldn't leave her, but it was really tempting. And I had already started making plans to do so. So, yeah, yeah. I, I've seen it. I've experienced it. I've gone through it. Um, you know, fathers will just throw their hands up and just walk away. And the kid is the one that's left behind suffering. Yeah, it makes a lifelong impact. Yeah. And although, you know, I'm a proponent of mediation. I it's yeah. it's awful. It's so traumatic to have to fight those battles in court. It really is. Mediation allows you a forum to reach agreements even if it's uncomfortable it's nothing like the trauma that happens when you're involved in yeah. litigation but it's not right for everyone you know yeah. some cases True. if someone's willing to make false allegations and you know you you can't force someone into mediation you know for some yeah. it's not a choice but well, if it is a choice and you can't force somebody to leave the anger at home and outside the door and sit down and right. concentrate on what is in the best interest of our child. Right. Yeah. But that's that's one of the reasons why mediation is so much uh, preferable, if especially if you have minor children, because you're yeah. going to have to work together for the rest of your life. Regardless, right. you're going to be joined together. You're going to have weddings, right. grandbabies you know, all these events that you're going to have to see the other person. Yeah. Um, and then when your children are minors, you're going to need to work together with, you know, birthdays and Christmas and your fa your relatives are coming to town and you mm -hmm. want to switch a weekend. It's really mm -hmm. hard to go into court, drag someone through the mud, you know, punch them till they're black and blue. And then two weeks later say, hey, can we switch next weekend? <laughs> you know, the answer is going to yeah. be no, of course. Right. Right. And you're absolutely so. correct. I agree 100%. And like I said, I, I did my second divorce in mediation and we, mm -hmm. but we went in there with no anger uh, between us. You know, uh, we decided, hey, we're going to have joint custody. Nobody's paying child support and you can have this. I'm going to take that, blah, blah, blah. And no mm -hmm. argument. And we went in front of the judge he hit the gavel, say, hey, okay, y'all good. See ya. And it was so easy. I mean, stress-free. Um, you know, everything was divided accordingly. And, you know, it, my son was, he was happy. Yeah. And that's yeah. what it's all about. If you share children, that's much more important that your child is, is well cared for and well adjusted than anything else. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I have really enjoyed this conversation, but that is our time for today. <laughs> but I want to okay. thank you, Lana, for really coming on the show and providing some really good information, information that I know our audience needs and will definitely benefit from. So I want to thank you for that. But before we go, why don't you tell the audience how they can get in touch with you if, should they need you? Absolutely. Um, my website is shearerlawandmediation.com. And I'm also on Facebook and on Instagram. And again, the name's right there, shearerlawandmediation.com. And you can also reach me by telephone the old-fashioned way at 916-226-1305. Um, and I'd be happy to help in any way I can. Okay. Well, that's great. But I, I, I know you're going to get some calls and um, you can definitely help. And I'm really, 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 really pleased to hear how you handling in your court and how that you are really looking at what's in the best interest of a child. And so thank you for what you do. Thank you for how you're handling your law firm. 
And, uh, you know, I look forward to having you back on the show again. Well, thank you very much. It was my pleasure to be here. I appreciate it. All right. Well, we're going to close this show out. So uh, thank you. And, you know, we'll talk here in a second. But ladies and gentlemen, that's our show for today. I want to thank you for joining us and thank Lana for coming on the show and providing this information. And I think, you know, this information that she gave should give us more hope and more knowledge that if we are going through a divorce, we know that, you know, it's not an uphill battle like it used to be. So I'm happy to hear that. But ladies and gentlemen, if you need additional resources, please go to the father show with Mike Thompson dot com and click on resources. Click on your state and you can find some resources there that can help you. And hopefully we'll get uh, Lana's information on our website as well. So if you're in the category. California area, you'll be able to get in touch with her as well. But before you go, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and let everybody else know and share the information so that people can get the help that they need. Because the whole purpose of the Father Show is to make sure men get the help and the information they need so they can be the best fathers that they can be and be the best husbands they can be as well so ladies and gentlemen thank you don't forget you can listen to us on spotify itunes uh twitter iheart radio and also you can find different shows on our youtube channel and also on our website the father show with mike thompson.com so thank you for joining us again this week We look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, stay safe and God bless.